Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm super excited to be here today. And I want to um, apologize in advance. I have my little one. If you hear noise in the background, that's, that's what that is. Um, but I am super excited to share some information about grants and funding your uh, startups and your nonprofits with some non-dilutive funding. Um, so as Michelle said, I am the founder of a company called Youth Enrichments. And um, we used to have a brick and mortar called Chicks with Class, where we would deliver these self-esteem based um, workshops for girls. And during the sort of the pandemic, I was in the middle of getting my MBA and I knew that I always wanted to bring in a grant writer for my company because we were eligible for grants. Though we were a nonprofit uh, company, I knew we were eligible for a ton of grants. So um, when we were locked in the house, didn't have anything to do, um, I sort of decided to take this elective during my MBA, which was a grant writing class. And I learned about writing grants, sourcing grants, um, and really winning money for my company. I was able to bring in about 50K and grant funding through uh, just writing grants myself, uh, finding them. And um, now we're actually up for about a $1.3 million grant from the federal government to implement a program with uh, using our solution. And I'm gonna talk more about that in a little bit, but what I really wanted to make you all aware of is the funding that is out there for any business for, in the form of grants and grants is really you know money that you don't have to pay back um so i'm gonna share my screen because i have a small little presentation let's see let's see okay and then just let me know you, can you all see my screen okay great um okay so Today's workshop is all about Grant Writing 101. So it's your guide to grant money and non-dilutive funding for your startup or nonprofit organizations. So grant announcements are generally um, announcements that are made via these websites. Like, And I'll give you the name of websites later, but they let the public know about grant funding that is available for a specific program competition. It's also referred to as a notice inviting applicant. So generally, You'll get these um, emails if you register for certain um, certain notifications telling you like, hey, there's a grant fund available. So go in and apply for A, B, C, or D. Depending on what you, what you put in for your preference, then you'll get these notifications via email. Um, so some of the locations of these announcements are ed.gov. Um, I have grants.gov is my favorite because they have a lot of federal funding announcements there. And the request amounts are generally higher. They're usually in the hundreds of thousands or the millions. Um, APA.gov is also a really great one. Um, and then grantwatch.gov is also another um, site that you can go to. And you can sign up for all of these, uh, all of these websites and then you'll be notified for certain grants. Um, and I'll sort of get into later how to how to put in certain, I guess, search mechanisms based on who you are, based on what your company is, based on what your nonprofit does, certain keywords to look for. So in order to be able to get these grants, right, you have to be grant ready. A lot of these websites want you to um, have a DUNS number. You need to have cage codes, you need to be registered at sam.gov, and then you need to be registered in grants.gov. So this is even with the apa.gov website that I gave earlier. Um, they all want you to have this prepared before you get ready and submit your proposal. So a DUNS number, I believe, I want to say it's like seven, seven or eight digits, but you go to, um, literally, you can just put in a uh, a search for a DUNS number. Now this doesn't cost anything. You don't have to pay to get a DUNS number, but you register your company and um, you're able to get your DUNS. There is a mechanism to where it allows you to register for a DUNS number. You can get it in like one to two days. That's usually the one that I would choose for my clients when I'm getting a DUNS number for them. So when you get the DUNS number, then you have to register in sam.gov. You can get your cage codes before or after, 
But when you go to register on stamps.gov, if you don't have cage codes, they'll generate that for you. And then you'll get an email from the cage code saying, okay, answer these few questions so that we can assign your cage code. So after you do those things, um, for grants.gov, which was the site that I gave earlier, you have to be registered in grants.gov. Now, this is a whole process within itself. And because we, when you're writing these proposals and requesting this funding, you're not requesting like, I don't know, $15. You're requesting like millions of dollars in funding. So they make the process very thorough. You have to register in grants.gov. Then you have to assign roles for people. Then once you assign roles for people, um, then you have to make sure that your entity is registered the correct way. But they do have numbers. They do have numbers on each one of these websites where if you have questions, you can just give them a call and grants.gov, they're open 24 hours a day. So if you have questions about anything, you can give them a call and they can walk you through the process. I'll vouch that they actually answered because <laughs> one time I was trying to finish a grant yes. last minute, literally right before the deadline, and they helped me out. So <laughs> yes, they do, and I love that they answer all the time. Um, they helped me walk. They walked me through a ton of things that I was confused about. But the service is completely free. Um, so there, these departments they generally use three different types of priorities when they're announcing grants. They do an absolute, a competitive, and an invitational. So an absolute preference um, is there, like there's an absolute preference that must be met. And if that priority is not addressed in your application or in your proposal, then your application won't be eligible for funding. The competitive um, type is, so they give a preference to applications that address, that address specific topic approaches or target populations. Can you hold on for a second, honey? No, I'm not gonna hold you. Okay, so um, so that's with the competitive. So that's generally, you know, you're, sorry, she's, I just want her to be quiet. <laughs> um, so when you're with it, when you're using a competitive type of grant, you're giving a preference to a specific topic, approach, or target population. Um, so usually in the form of additional points being added to the peer review score, as long as you're addressing each one of these points, then that means that you'll get the points that 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 is allowed for that stop. stop so invitational so applicants are encouraged to address a specific topic but the applicant will not receive any competitive preference points if the invitational priority is not addressed um so generally when you're looking for the specific grant for funding opportunities you'll know if it's absolute, if it's competitive or invitational. And I will show you an example of one that was absolute. I'm gonna show you that, that um, example in a little bit. So what are the selection criteria? So selection criteria are used Wait, by you hurt me. the applicant. You hurt me, mommy. I'm sorry. Can you be quiet now? Okay. So the selection criteria is used by the applicant or shape or design that the project or activity is to be carried out. Um, and then peer reviews to score and evaluate um, the quality of the applicants. So when you submit these different proposals, they're all reviewed by, some of them call them uh, like grant reviewers or peer reviews, but they're looking at everything that you submit and they're scoring it. And each one of these grants, if you look, each of the proposals, they have different scoring criteria. Okay, so some of the quality use selection criteria is oh, the quality of the project design, right? So how well are you proposing that the project is developed? And the point range is from there is anywhere from 30 to 50 points. And generally, each one of these funding opportunities, you can get up to 100 points to be funded. So based on how many points you're getting, um, all of this criteria is being used in calculating your points. So quality of the project evaluation. Um, so quality of the project evaluation conducted um, of the proposed project. There's something called a local evaluator, and that's something that I use. Once you get into the whole grant writing process, you'll find out or, or you'll learn more about 
local evaluations and national evaluations. Sometimes these oh, um, funders, they want you to perform local evaluations because they want to make sure oh, you're conducting God. the research needed oh, to yeah. ensure that you're making the impact that, you're, that you want your project to make. Um, and the need for the project, right? And I'm gonna show you an example of this in a little bit, but the applicant identifies the magnitude or severity of the problem that will be addressed by the proposed project. And all of this is gonna go into your project narrative and we'll go into that in a little bit as well. So the significance- you hurt me. Stop. You hurt me. I didn't hurt you. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, we did. Okay. So the significance is the importance of the problem or the issues to be addressed. So in the previous slide, I discussed um, the three different types. So the absolute competitive or invitational. So based on whichever one of these priorities you're submitting your proposal under, your the significance of that project is going to be defined within that project narrative. So if you are submitting something under um, an absolute, right? If, if it's an absolute type, then you already know what the, what the significance of the problem is. And then you just have to prove with research why that problem is so significant and why your project should be selected. So quality of management plan. Um, so this is in turn. This is in regards to who you're bringing on to make sure that your project is managed the correct way. Um, the quality of project services. So this is like the quality of the services to be provided by the proposed project. Um, quality of project personnel. So these are the people that you have included in your proposal, right? So. A lot of times when people submit proposals, you have to make sure that you have qualified people in your proposal. You can't just submit something and say, oh, I, I can complete, um, I don't know, a biometric design and we're, we're trying to figure out some, you know, quant quantum physics, but you have nobody in your, in your proposal who has that, who has those qualities or who has that experience. So they're checking to make sure the people that you have included in your proposal are, they have the experience sufficient enough to carry out the, um, to carry out the mission of the project. Um, and then the adequacy of resources. Right? So you wanna, you wanna make sure that the resources included in your proposal are adequate to also meet the needs of that funder's problem. Okay, so when it comes to eligible entities, and I get this question so many times, because some people think that you can only be a nonprofit to qualify for certain grants, and that's just simply not true. So there are a ton of different entities. Can you repeat that? Can you say that again so they heard you in the back? Like, yes. like you don't have to be a nonprofit to be eligible to receive grant funds. So these are types of eligible entities that can go after these grant funds. So there are for-profit uh, organizations you. other than small businesses, wow. um, Native American tribal governments, public and state controlled institutions of higher education, county governments, private institutions of higher education, um, nonprofits that do not have 501c3 status. So this is this means like you have a nonprofit status, but maybe it's just with your state and you don't have it federally. Um, public housing authorities, I actually had applied for, I had written a proposal for one of my past clients and it was with the public housing authority. Um, city or township governments, state governments, nonprofits having 501 status with the IRS, um, small businesses are even on here. Stop it. Um, special district governments and then independent school districts um, and then in native tribal organizations. Um, so all of these are entities that are generally eligible for grants, but you have to look at that funding announcement. And I want to do, I want to walk you through an actual exercise of going into grants.gov and actually, um, looking for a grant for, for your, uh, for your, your company. Okay. So, and these are more, um, eligible entities. So local education, energy agency, an LEA, or a state education agency, like TEA would be a state educational agency that's eligible for a grant. Um, it was interesting because when I was looking for grants, I had actually found a grant that I was perfect for, but it was for a state educational agency. So I did all the work 
and I, I sat in on the webinar and they were like, well, are you an SC, an SCA? And I was like, wait, what is that? And it was like, you have to be a state education. I was like, okay, well, no, I'm not. So then I ended up contacting the TA and I was like, hey, there's this grant that y'all need to get so I can come under you as a subcontractor. And, but it was, but so it, you really have to pay attention Mommy, to what you're eligible for. Um, give me one second. I'm going to put her in the house because she's so loud. Fine. So thank you so much. Like all the chat, if you guys are following the chat, it's all props because mamas are superheroes, as Dolores said. And then you add on top of that female entrepreneurs that are also mamas, like a whole other level. So thank you for that. Um, as a, we've just, if you guys have any questions so far and you want to start dropping them into the chat, there's going to be a Q and A at the end, but that's so that you do not forget, you can go ahead and start dropping them live in the chat and Marco will get to those after. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, there are the LEAs and then there are the state education agencies. Um, so as you're looking, I don't know what type of businesses you have, but as you're looking through these funding announcements, you have to make sure you're paying attention to what types of entities are eligible for certain grants? Because there are certain opportunities where you have to be a nonprofit. And I'll get, I'll, I'll kind of get through a way around that in a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay, so in a lot of these applications, there are terms that you should be familiar with. So budget is a term, that's the recipient's financial plan for carrying out the project or program. Grantee, that's the legal entity that has been awarded financial assistance under one of the under one of the funding opportunities. And then project, that just means the activities described in an application. So really familiarize yourself with, uh, with these different types of terms. So when it comes to writing your proposal, there are several things that you should do. One is you need to prepare right? So you have to prepare to submit these, especially if the proposals are huge and they're requ they're wanting like a hundred different pages. Um, you also want to develop your idea. So develop your idea. What, I, what, what are you going to come up with in order to implement um, this program? Um, community support. You have to get some type of support from your community in order to be able to carry out um, these these funding ideas. Because if nobody knows what you're doing, you don't have any LOUs or MOUs or you don't have any letters of support to put inside of your proposal, right? So then they're gonna say, well, who is this organization that's, that's submitting this proposal and who's actually supporting their idea? Um, so the next one is identifying funding resources. Some funding opportunities, they want you to do grant matching. So grant matching is where if you're requesting $450,000 from an entity, they're expecting you to match those funds dollar for dollar from a, another entity. This could be funding that's given to you. This could be in-kind donations or whatever the case may be, but they're expecting you to identify those funding resources. Um, and then the next one is, <laughs> I, I, I spelled the word wrong, but getting organized to write the proposal. Um, it takes a lot to put these proposals together. And this is why a lot of people hire grant writers to do this because you have to be very efficient. Like your wording has to be um, on point. Everything has to, you have to write everything to where you're comparing what you wrote to whatever their scoring guide is. And then you have to write an effective proposal. Make sure that, that the proposal that you're putting together is effective in a way that you're meeting that funder's problem. So whatever problem that they have, you want to make sure that you're writing that proposal in a way that's describing how you, as the grantee, is going to solve that problem for them. And like I said, I'm going to get into a grant later, and this was an actual proposal that I had written. Um, so the basic components of a proposal, you know, you have your cover letter, um, your proposal summary or the abstract, um, introduction describing the grant seeker or the organization, problem statement or need statement, uh, project objectives, project methods or design, project evaluation, um, future funding, and then the project budget. So all of these are components that are going to be in your proposals. Now, every grant opportunity is not as 
complicated or as complex, but when you're going after the huge dollars, this is generally the basic components of a proposal. Um, okay, so, and these are more definitions that are used. Uh, so project narrative, um, these are, when you're, when you're talking about a project narrative, this is pretty much the beef of your application. The budget narrative is the grant money or the grant budget that will include all money spent during the course of the grant. So if you have a three-year program or a five-year program, you have to make sure you're including in that budget narrative everything that's going to be covered. So this is from the supplies to personnel to salary to fringe benefits. Everything has to be included in this budget narrative so that you can justify why you're requesting $1.2 million. Um, and then the evaluation, the grant evaluation that outlines how the grant seeker intends to prove or disprove the effectiveness of the grant program. Um, and there are so many different types of programs that that evaluation can be used for. So getting started, you want to make sure that you allow yourself plenty of time to prepare and submit these grants because you have to do research behind um, writing that proposal. And then you need about 25 to 40 hours of you know preparing that grant. Read the application package in its entirety. So I'll tell you a story about this. I had submitted a grant last year. It was from grants.gov. And I read the language, right? I read everything that they, that they wanted us to, to put together. And there was a section on there that said, okay, this is the maximum that you can request for the budget period. And this is the minimum that you can request for the budget period. But they made a mistake in the funding announcement. And they later published another version of the funding announcement that I didn't see. So when I submitted my grant, I had not went back and looked at the latest version of whatever that announcement was. So it turns out that I had requested like, I wanna say like $800,000 less than what I was supposed to submit because they were asking, hold on one second. My eyes, my eyes. I'm sorry. This is, this is the life of mothers. Okay, um, but no, I had submitted the grant. I, I submitted the proposal and I requested like 800,000 less than I was supposed to. Because what they did was they announced later that you could request more per project period. And I'll explain like the difference between project periods and budget periods, but you have to make sure you read the language and go back to that website and make sure that you're going off the latest, um, the latest proposal or the latest funding announcement. Okay, come on. Come on. I need my phone. Go get your phone. Go get your phone and then come back. Come on. <laughs> okay, so I'm multitasking. All right, so um so you have to read the application package in its entirety. And I will tell you a lot of these funders, I feel like they put language in here to make it seem like you're not, you, you can't get the grant because they want you to work really hard. Like they want you to read through the entire funding announcement to make sure, hey, did you, did you read all the language that you were supposed to read? And honestly, half of the grants that I've applied for, I didn't think I was eligible initially until I went back and I actually read what they wanted us to do. And I seen, oh, well, they just want us to do a 12-week program and put in an evidence-based curriculum. Oh, okay, that's easy, right? But you got to make sure you're actually reading through the funding announcement to make sure you understand what it is that that funder wants. Okay, so, and then if you do have questions about any of those funding opportunities, there are always numbers that you can contact. I can literally count how many times I've called and asked questions. They probably know me by my name because I'm always calling. Like, hey. You have a VIP line. It just goes yes. right through the front. <laughs> I swear. I mean, the number is there. The email is there. And I'm like, I want to make sure I submit this thing right. 
So, you know, um, and I mean, they're, they're really nice. You know, they don't have a problem with answering questions. That's what they put the information there for. Um, so yes, always contact that uh, manager if you have a problem or if you have a question or if, you, if you're not sure about something. Um, okay, so preparing your proposal, right? So you wanna make sure you follow the suggested formatting guidelines. Do not deviate from whatever it is that they want you to put in that proposal. Just follow that like line by line, literally. Structure your narrative according to the selection criteria. This makes it easier for the peer reviewers to evaluate your proposal. So if you are structuring your narrative, and I'm gonna show you what, what an actual scoring card looks like and how I structure my proposal. But if you're structuring it that way, they know, oh, well, this person actually read what I wanted them to read, right? And then they're not going all over the place in your proposal looking for, okay, well, did, did this person include this or did they include that? Because you're structuring everything in the way that they put it in the original funding announcement. Um, so pay careful attention to the language that you use. Be clear, concise, and specific. You have to be specific as possible when putting these proposals together um, because they'll ding you. If they don't understand something that you put in there, they'll take points off. Um, you want to justify your funding request according to the proposed project activities and check all budget figures for accuracy. Um, keep in mind the cost must be reasonable and necessary. Right. So you can't put in there, you can't request money for something that you can't justify. So if you're justifying it, though, in your budget narrative and then throughout the project, they understand why you're asking for that money. Um, then you also want to make sure you proofread your proposal. I literally have like five different people read my proposal to make sure like we're checking for spelling errors. We're checking for grammatical errors. We're making sure we're not duplicating anything, but it's necessary because when the peer reviewers get your proposal, this is exactly what they're going to do. Um, okay, so more submitting your proposal. Don't wait until the last minute. Now, I'm one to talk, but I'm a huge procrastinator. And this last grant that I had to submit, I have no idea why I waited six months to get my DUNS number and get registered at SAMS. I don't know why I did that. But it was like <laughs> the pressure was on, right? This is why you shouldn't wait to the last minute. Like, make sure you have everything. You, you have your registration. Everything is, like, taken care of before you actually go in and submit. Now, when you start to do these and you're, like, comfortable with submitting and writing, you may be a little bit more relaxed. But I would just suggest... Getting it done early, as early as possible, is the best um, the best form. Um, and if you're submitting an e-application, know the specific deadline, date, and time. A lot of these funders want you to request via either email or you're requesting or you're submitting via grants.gov. Um, if a competition does not require an electronic submission um, and you experience any type of technical problems in submitting it, um, that can be quickly resolved. Just print your application, submit it in hard copy before the application deadline. Now, a lot of these funders, they have a deadline. If you're submitting a hard copy, you have to submit that before usually the electronic copy is due. So it's usually like five o'clock central standard time to submit a hard copy. But if you're Baby, doing it electronically, it's like 11.59 PM. Baby, so you're buying like, yourself extra time yeah, if you submit it electronically. Um, have a fresh pair of eyes. Read the proposal again, um, and then make sure that all the required forms and signatures are included. If you miss a signature, you know they'll they may just throw that page out, and then it deems you ineligible to receive. It and then you got to try again. So just make sure you have all of the signatures required before you submit your application. So common mistakes: failing to allow enough time to submit via mail or electronically not reading the application package in its entirety, not following formatting guidelines, not getting the signatures, and then failing to proofread. So many people fail to do these simple things, but you want to make sure you proofread, get the signatures, um, allow yourself enough time, and really follow the formatting guidelines. Don't try to get fancy. Don't try to do anything extra. Just follow the guidelines that they put forth for you. Um, so these are some of the common questions. What is the deadline date? Am I eligible? Can I sign the required docs? Um, can I send the package after the deadline date? The answer is no, unless there's like a, an emergency situation that you can prove, um, then they might let you submit. But other than that, no. 
Um, where do I go for additional questions? Will this grant be offered again next year? I'll say there's a 50-50 chance that the grant that you're applying for will be offered again the next year because it's a federal funds. Um, and then can my senator send a letter of support? So I had I have reached out to the mayor's office actually. And I got a reply because I needed a letter of support for a program, but there was like a discrepancy because I think they may have been going after the same like grant and they didn't want to take money away from the city. So they couldn't do the letter. Girl, stop. Um, and then will the deadline be extended? The answer is usually no. Um, and then what, hap what happens after I, after I receive my proposal? So after the proposal is submitted, they generally give like I don't know three months of review time, oh. and then you'll get you'll get an answer on whether or not you were approved. Um, and it's like the anticipation, right? Because a lot of these grants are very competitive. So you put in all of this hard work, and it is a lot of hard work. Or you, or you pay somebody like anywhere from I don't know three to five thousand dollars to write you a proposal, and then you're like, okay, am I gonna get the money or not? It's definitely a it's a risk either way you look at it because you're you're risking your time or you're risking the, the money that you spend to have somebody prepare that proposal for you but at the end of the day when you do submit it and you get, if even if you don't get it the first time they always send you a scorecard and say okay these are your strengths these are your weaknesses so that way you can go back and you can change whatever you need to change and then resubmit again the next year um and that's that's what I did. So I'm gonna first I'll go into questions and then I want to go into an actual proposal that I had written so that I can show you what one actually looks like um, and then what the process looks like when you're submitting. Okay. Okay, does anybody have any questions so far? You can either unmute your mic and ask directly or type it in the chat. Hey, Margo, this is Clara. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. This was really helpful and informative. Um, and I've got a question about, do you have any statistics or information around like what percentage of grant applicants are actually awarded funding? Like, what's the hit rate on this? Um, so it's hard to say because each grant is different. Um, I, I guess I can give you an example. Like I submitted a proposal for a program that had maybe like 200 applicants, I, I believe. It was either, it was like 180 mm. to 200 applicants. Like, yes. And um, yes. Mm, they had maybe 30 awards yes. available. So only 30 people out of those 200 uh, had gotten awarded. Yes. Yes. And um, I'm going to oh, show you. Yes. Yes what the outcome was for me for that grant, the proposal that I had submitted. So that's really hard to tell, but you can always contact that funding manager and you can ask them how many people submitted proposals last year, right? And then how many awards were given? Those, that, those were questions that I asked because I wanted to know, like how many people actually submitted, how many people actually got the awards. And then I like to do a lot of research. So I was able to go onto the website and look at past awardees, how much they were awarded, where were they awarded? Um, and I, I even contacted some of the agencies who were awarded and I said, okay, like how, how was that process for you? How did you, um, what did you put in your language? Um, and I, I just, I asked a bunch of questions, but you can always call that funder and just ask them, ask them those questions. Okay. Oh, that's true. Any other questions? Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm in the car. I'm Marilyn. This is wonderful. Thank you so much, Margo. I appreciate the information. I have not been proficient in pursuing grants for a lot of the reasons you said the things we should do. <laughs> and I and I love the fact that you have your baby there because that was my life. Um, I had two kids by myself and trying to get through school and run businesses. It's all part of life. They make it richer. My question is, I started to type it, but I'm like, let me not drive and type and talk at the same time. Okay, so I've parked. And my question is, how do I look for specific grants for targeted populations? I have an organization 
and I targeted specific population veterans, specifically women veterans. And I know occasionally there are overt grants that come up for us, but I just wanted to know, is there a simpler process for me to develop a database of these kind of grants? So there is, and since you actually asked the question, I'll use you as an example, because I wanna walk you all through how to look for these grants, how to put it in certain keywords. So I'll actually use your business as an example of, of how to do that. And I'll, so you'll see some grants that pop up. Um, that I find. Okay. Do you want the name of it? Yeah, you, if you can put it in the chat, that'd be great. Okay, it's real easy. Women Veterans Business Center. I'll put it in the chat. Nice. I'm a veteran too, so that's cool. What branch? Army. Hey, who are? Me too. We need to talk. Oh, hey, battle. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an old vet though. <laughs> <laughs> Still standing. Yes, ma'am. I knew I was supposed to be on this call. Hello. Of course. I love it. Um, okay, so I don't see any other questions in the chat. So if you guys think of some, go I ahead and type them. One quick question. Sorry, I was I didn't type Oh, yeah, out. go ahead. Um, hi, Margo. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Dolores. I had a question earlier. Uh, forgive me if I misheard, but you said that you were in the process of applying for a federal grant. And I've heard a lot about federal grants being very difficult to obtain if you haven't received them beforehand. So what has your process been um, applying for federal grants? So um, I'm going to go over that process with you all today. Um, one, it wasn't that two, difficult for me. Three, it's super competitive. Six. Yes. But um, one, I feel like it's worth it. Two, I, don't, I don't think anyone three. ever gets the, the grant the first time around that they're applying. But it's really worth submitting it. Like, do your best. Write the best proposal possible and submit that. Um, I'm going to pull up. Uh, yeah. Let me pull up my scorecard because I want to show you all what it looks like. Uh, and this was my first time submitting a proposal of this magnitude. Let's see. I got you. I got you. Okay. Bless you. You're welcome. Let's see. I have to go through my email. And then while you pull that up, Margo, I'll add one more thing in there as well. It's like how, um, how does somebody... It, make the decision of whether or not they should apply for a grant based on thinking through, okay, how much time is it going to take? How many awards are they going to give? And what's my probability of getting selected? Is that even the way to look at it? Um, do you have any tips on that? Yeah, so I wouldn't look at it like, am I going to get selected? Honestly, um, I would if there's a, a grant that I think that I'm eligible for and I read the funding announcement, I'm just going to apply. Like I'm going to write the proposal and I'm going to apply because at the end of the day, even if I don't get it the first time, I'm probably going to get it the second time because I'm going to take everything that they asked me to do and I'm going to correct whatever and then I'm going to submit. And then if I don't get it the second time, I'm going to submit again. But that's just me. I, I, am, I don't like to take no for an answer. I'm like, no, y'all got to look at this again right so um take a look at it again and nine times out of ten like sooner or later you're going to get the grant um so i'm not sure can you all see my screen like do you see the applicant yes. final panel stuff okay yeah so this was the proposal that i submitted last year right um i got 93.67 points it was super great because this is the first time that i had ever submitted this type of proposal. And I had requested $445,000. And um, this was the proposal where they submitted another funding announcement after I submitted my grant or after I submitted the proposal. So I was supposed to request an extra like 800K, but I had no idea. So as you see, 
they go over all of my strengths and my weaknesses. I didn't have many weaknesses, um, but you need like it's out of a hundred points total. So some of the weaknesses were okay. The applicant neglects to provide specific data regarding SCI, and then hold on one second, Malia, please be quiet. You don't have to be that loud. Okay, we know that you know your ABCs. Okay, okay, so. Um, I wrote a grant for a teen pregnancy prevention program. So my company, we provide self-esteem based learning solutions for children. And I know that one of the things that are attributed to low self-esteem is teen pregnancy. So I found this grant to implement a teen pregnancy prevention program. So what my proposal was on was we want to use self-esteem development as a way to prevent teen pregnancy. And we're going to do that through this platform that we're creating that's going to apply things like artificial intelligence and deep learning tools. But they want to make sure that we're using a medically accurate and evidence-based curriculum. So what I did was I wrote my proposal to say, we're going to use an evidence-based curriculum within our platform, we're just gonna plug it in and we're going to be able to deliver these programs in the schools. So like the middle schools and the high schools, right? Um, so one of the things, and I'll show you my actual proposal, and this is the one that I had submitted again this year. But um, so one of the things that they said in here was, well, you don't put any um, data in here about sexually transmitted infections, right? So, okay, all I had to do was do the research, what's the rates for STIs and young people in Houston? And then I just included that chart in my new proposal, right? Um, mommy, another weakness would mommy, have been- Mommy, go with me. Go with see. me, mommy. Go with me. Okay, the applicant fails to me, include mommy. adequate and specific Mom, retention strategies as it relates to their target population, right? Me, so Mom, they wanted us Mom, to make sure, how are, you, how are we gonna retain these young people in the program? How are we going to make sure that the middle school students and the high school students want to remain active in our program? So I just had to go in and bullet or highlight how we're going to do that. For us, we're doing that through celebrity engagement, right? So we're going to invite little celebrities to their schools. And I included that in the budget. So we're going to need money, right, to pay the speakers to come out and talk to the kids. So that was our retention strategy. Um, so like I said, the document outlines a bunch of strengths and a bunch of weaknesses. So all I did was went through from this score that I got, which was 93.67 points and I needed hundred. So I didn't miss by a whole lot. So this is the new proposal. And this is how my actual proposal is structured. The actual narrative is about 70 pages, right? So we have needs for assistance. Remember I talked about the need statement. So the needs for assistance had to do research. Why should we implement a teen pregnancy prevention program here in Houston? Well, here's why, right? Because the University of Texas says that the teen pregnancy rate is, in Harris County, it's amongst the highest and it overlaps the national teen pregnancy rate, right? So the need is, is all there. Then I went in and I included information about STIs. I just included a couple of sentences and then here's a link to where that data came from because you have to make sure you're including the links. You can't just throw something in there and then they're like, okay, where did you get the information from? Did you just make that up, right? So it's literally like writing a paper for college. <laughs> so, um, so I just put in there the statistics, right? So in 2018, youth between the ages of 15 to 24 had the highest reported rates of gonorrhea. This is why we need this pregnancy program here because we need to educate youth on X, Y, Z, right? So then letters of support from the community. Because of the work that I had done before, I was able to reach out to a lot of these organizations and entities and say, hey, I want to implement a teen pregnancy prevention program. Can you write a letter of support or can we get an MOU? Uh, for my organization in specific, we had already gotten... Um, approved vendor status with Houston Independent School Districts, which is one of the largest in, in Texas. So we had we had the opportunity to include that in our, our appendices. Um, so 
Um, I'll go into the budget. So this was what a budget line item. I created this in Microsoft Excel. No, no, no. Uh, Google Sheets. It was just, uh, you know, okay, this is how much we're going to spend on personnel, friends, benefits, travel, but you have to make sure you put all of these line items in here so that there's a total this is how much we need in total, stop, right? Stop, stop, and then this is the budget narrative down here. So budget justification. This is why we need the money because we're gonna hire so and so. We're gonna pay them forty five thousand a year. Um, you have to make sure you include all of this in your projects or in your proposals because if you don't, they're gonna ding you and they're gonna say, okay, well, why why are you requesting this much money? You know. Um, sorry, there's a fly. Um, okay, so local evaluation. I talked a little bit about local evaluation. This is something that I would highly suggest you, you get when you do proposals like these because you're hiring a company to do a local evaluation of your project. So they're going to spend the, the entire three years with you making sure that they conduct the necessary research so that you can go back and say, hey, we, I'm, I hired a company called Hypothesize. And they're going to do like a quasi analysis study, impact evaluation analysis. They're going to do all of that for the project over the course of three years. Um, so this is what a budget narrative looks like. And this is pretty much the entire proposal. Now, if you go over the allotted pages, so if they say, a hundred pages, stop, stop, stop. right? The budget narrative can be no more than 70 pages, stop, stop, and then your appendices stop, stop. can be no more than 30 pages. They're just going to throw out all of the extra pages, that you have, and they're not going to read it. So make sure that you stay under however many pages that they're requesting. Um, okay, so if you have any questions about this, entire process then please let me know uh, but this is what a budget narrative looks like i have my resumes in um remember i talked about personnel one of the things that they had asked me last year was make how do we know that you you can complete this type of work though i work with you i have not done anything in relates to like, sexual education so i had to make sure i brought those people onto my team so like ann mason matson for example she has extensive experience in um sexual education and youth so i reached out to her and i said hey would you like to be a part of my team of course you know so she sent me over her resume now so now she's included in the proposal so when i submitted it now it's a lot stronger than it was last year because they see that i have all of this experience and then something else that i did was i went to planned parenthood and i just got a certificate on sexual youth education right so now i can include that in my resume so now that they see since i'm going to be the project manager oh this person has xyz experience um so of course they can carry out you know the everything we need for this project and one of the main things that they care about is they want to make sure that you're including medically accurate and evidence-based curriculum so when you're looking at that funding announcement no, make no, sure no. that whatever that thing is no, no, that they no, want no, you to do, no, no, no. make sure you no, 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 no. include that and repeat it no, 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 all throughout your proposal. Like we're going to include X, Y, Z because they want to make sure, you know, that you're sticking to the plan. Um, so I have all the research in, I have all of my resumes, um, like, and I want to show you a logic model because all... Even if you're not planning to submit a proposal right now, I would highly suggest you put together a logic model because you need these anyway. Um, I'm just gonna go to my handy dandy type tables or table of contents because I don't feel like searching through it. Okay, so logic model. So this is a logic model. This is what it looks like. So logic model, you're going, what are the inputs? Who is the type of population? What are the activities? What are the outputs? Short-term outcomes midterm outcomes and long term outcomes. So I would highly suggest you do this for your company, for your nonprofit, or whatever type of business that you have. So that when it comes time to like you use this as sort of um, like your base, you know, you're you're using this to write out proposals, to make company plans, whatever the case is. Um, but logic models are super imperative to have with your uh, with your company. And this is this is what my logic model looks like for this particular program. Um, and I'm gonna pause and ask if anyone has any questions. Right now. 
Um, if you have any questions, you can just unmute yourself. This ahead, is Mary. Mary. And I have a question. Um, this is amazing. What was the name of the group that you partner with to follow you so they could um, research and um, provide statistics about the results of your program? When you said, what was the name of the group? Yeah, the, the research group that you use to um, like do uh, um, oh, the local evaluation. Yes, could you put that oh. in the chat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, so she's based in Michigan. Um, but I'm just going to put, I'll put her company in here, but then they also have a ton of different companies. Um, all you have to do is search local evaluation companies. And then the name of the group that I hired is Hypothesi. Oops, I hope I spelled that right. Um, and they're based out of Michigan. Um, so yeah, so this is, this is pretty much what a full proposal looks like. Um, and of, of course I didn't include the appendices, but you know, I wanted to make sure I included charts in here to demonstrate teen pregnancy, birth rates, um, geographic location. We want to put the program in Houston, specifically Harris County, here is why. Um, so whatever grant that you're writing, and I actually wrote this, a same proposal for somebody else but it was for a completely different state. It was for Louisiana. Um, and it was interesting because, so, and I'm gonna stop my share. Um, so a lot of these proposals or these grants, right? You can get federally contracted because you're using your solution. Like for me, for example, I'm using obviously my platform, which is my e-learning platform to solve a lot of these issues for funders. and it's interesting how you can use what you've already built or use what you already have as a way to solve a federal issue or a federal problem, right? Um, so I was actually approached by this other VC firm because they were like, oh my God, that is so like innovative how you are using your self-esteem based e-learning platform as a way to prevent teen pregnancy but it's also a way to prevent youth suicide it's also a, a way to detect youth suicide because of the different algorithms that we're using in the technology so i had actually written a proposal for another young lady she's based in houston but she wants to put her program in louisiana and what i did was wrote her proposal but i wrote it in a way that she's using my technology that I'm gonna pay for, or that the federal government is gonna pay for to have created, right? So this is a way that you're commercializing your innovation. And when you look at like a lot of SBIR, STTR, and I'm gonna put that in the chat because those are, those are also, um, it's like American Seed Fund. Um, I didn't include that, I don't know why, but those are American Seed Funds. You write proposals and you can get funding. Um, and then, so real quick, I wanna run through the question that Marilyn has. I'm going to share my screen. Because I wanna show you what, I, what, what my process is like when I'm actually looking for grants. I go to grants.gov. And then Marilyn, you said you, so I'm just gonna put in the keyword veteran, right? So when you go to grants.gov, you go to like this search bar and you're looking for grant opportunities. So I'm just gonna put veteran in there. Um, so as you see, there are a ton of like veteran grant opportunities. I'm not sure if it's like what you're looking for, but veterans housing rehabilitation and modification pilot program. Um, they have, their stuff is due coming up on July 30th. Um, they also have a Rural Veterans Health Access Program. Um, so while uh, Marco does that search, I just wanted to thank you all again for joining. If you do have to hop off, uh, thank you for participating in today's session.
Uh, we will be sharing the recording with you. And then if you were in the actual live session, you, you get a copy of the slide deck, not the proposals, but the slide deck. <laughs> um, and then um, I just wanted to add one thing, Margot, is that I love that you did walk us through that example because sometimes you, it's easy to like say to someone, hey, do it this way. But when you physically see, you no, know, you were, when you made the comment earlier of literally sticking to the format that the agency is requesting and verbatim, like literally putting, here's the question, here's the answer, here's the question, here's the answer, here's the topic, here's the answer, versus trying to create this like beautifully written like narrative. Um, I really appreciate that you showed us that, that a real life example. It's my pleasure. Um, no, because I, I know that it, there is money out here for any type of company, any type of organization. It's just a matter of finding it. And it was really my goal with this workshop to go into depth of how to find it, what to look for, and really use it like a real, real world example of what I was able to do um, in looking for a grant for, for my company. Um, and I was, what, seven points away from being funded. But you know, I really think everything happens for a reason. And I'm glad that I didn't get it last year because I didn't request enough money. <laughs> so when I submitted it this year, I was able to request, um, you know, the correct amount. And uh, hopefully we're, we're going to see what happens. Um, I have like a 95% confidence that I'm going to get funded. Um, I'm pretty sure I am. So we'll see what happens. I found a ton of entrepreneurship like opportunities geared towards women. And I want to say it was earlier this year. Um, it, I don't think it was specifically towards veterans, but you could have spent it, you know, to include veterans. But um, this, this is like what you would do when you're looking for um, funding opportunities for your business. Go on grants.gov, use different keywords to find whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, like, I don't know. I knew that self-esteem was a core reason to like teen pregnancy, suicide. So I look for teen pregnancy grants, suicide prevention grants. Um, so don't always use like what is commonly researched, like kind of be creative in how you're researching different funding opportunities. Yeah, it's like find your angle, right? Like how yeah. do you, yeah, because there's not, maybe you'll get super lucky and there'll be a grant specifically written exactly uh, set up for the exact type of work that you do, but most likely there won't be one. So you'll have to find your niche inside of the language that has been provided. Um, but yeah, Margo, thank you so much. Um, I think thank that you. I, I think there might be popular demand to do a follow-up, just like an AMA, like ask me anything, <laughs> Q and live Q&A <laughs> session with yeah. you on this. For sure. Um, we will be sharing um, the information, like I said, and then how, what's the preferred method for people to contact you if they have any additional questions? So I'm putting my email in the chat um, because grant writing is something that I do, like grant writing, grant researching, um, grant sourcing. So ambitiousgirlstartup at gmail.com. Um, I've written a ton of different grants and uh, done a, a ton of different like RFPs for people, so. Um, awesome. We'll definitely make sure to include that uh, in the follow-up email to everybody. And again, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, for giving us a glimpse into your mom entrepreneur life and uh, <laughs> applause to your assistant. <laughs> well, thank you. Look, I'm sorry she was so loud. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Have a, a great rest of your day.